Greetings. I'm Robert Price, the Associate Vice Chancellor for Research here on the Berkeley campus. And it is my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the campus to this Constitution, Constitution Day forum dealing with the topic national security, the war on terror, and the Constitution. The attack on 9-11 wasn't quite like Pearl Harbor or when Germany invaded Poland September 1st, 1939. It wasn't the opening salvo in a military campaign to overtake the United States. It wasn't softening us up for the invasion to come. It was a strike at the heart of our systems, our transportation system, our economic system, our, syst our stability, our, our psychological system. It, the, the essence of terrorism is to try to disrupt, to try to, to, to pick, make you think about things, to th throw uh, a wrench into uh, the way you live your lives. And that should have caused us to realize that we have big gaps in some of our systems, not just our economic and transportation systems, but our, in our electoral systems. So for example, you know, 9-11 happened in September. What if it had happened in October or November, leading up to the presidential election in, in an, uh, an election year? Um, you know, our succession statutes are a mess. Um, some of them are largely unconstitutional. They provide for legislative succession, and with all due apologies to a former congressman, uh, legislators cannot constitutionally be in the line of succession. The Constitution forecloses that under the best reading. Um, you know, if one of the major candidates from one of the two parties were to, to, to take ill or be killed or incapacitated in the week leading up to the November election, we have no statutory means for dealing with that. Or what happens if there's terrorism after election day before the Electoral College meets? There are so many holes in our our succession uh, and, 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 uh, and uh, election system. And, and, you know, after Kennedy was assassinated, we tried to fix some of those by the 25th Amendment. Um, that's what provided for kind of the uh, presidential disability and what we do then. But the 25th Amendment kind of poses as many questions as it resolves, and we haven't begun to do the work we need to do uh, in that regard. 9-11 should have focused our constitutional energy on that. Um, Second point I guess I'd make maybe diverges a little bit from, uh, from what Professor Abrams said. Uh, you know, I grew up, like most of us, um, kind of believing that the most important safeguard for our liberty uh, is a constitutional system of enumerated rights uh, that are enforced by a vigorous judiciary. I mean, that's the, that's, courts are the heroes of the latter part of the 20th century American liberty story. Post Brown versus the Board of Education, uh, courts told Richard Nixon to turn over the tapes. Um, uh, and so we, we tend to think of, of rights that are judicially enforceable as the primary strategy. And again, you know, I, I clerked for Justice Blackmun on the Supreme Court. You know, I read cases for a living. I have a constitutional law case book. Judicial cases are, are, are my life, but you know, as I reflect on things more, you know, the framers of the Constitution did not really rely nearly as much on the strategy of judicially enforceable rights to, as the preamble says, secure the blessings of liberty, as they did the, they relied on a different strategy more, and that was the idea of bringing 13 separate sovereign nations that were the states in 1776, bringing them together in a single indivisible political unit so that it wouldn't be like Europe where everyone is defending their borders against everybody else on the new continent and kind of weakening each other because of, uh, because of border uh, uh, skirmishes. The framers knew that if you created one cohesive country on this new island continent, that our oceans would protect us and our liberty more than anything else. That was the biggest thing they, they relied on. That's why they, they didn't provide for much of a standing army in the original Constitution. That's why the militia clauses pro pro provide a check, a state check on a national standing army. They placed a lot more faith on a navy than an army. Uh, and indeed, our early military uh, campaigns, War of 1812, which is really the second War of Independence, was largely a, a naval campaign. Um, and, you know, that strategy, which was really based on an analogy to Great Britain and Switzerland, which were protected by the English Channel and the, the Alps, respectively, uh, that worked for about 150 years um, uh, until Pearl Harbor, and indeed, until putting aside kind of Hawaii, which is off the, the continent, of course, before 9-11, the last time an organized foreign enemy spilled significant blood on U.S. soil was in 1814. 
So for, for you know, almost 200 years, this strategy of, of kind of, of, of oceanic isolation um, really worked, but that strategy has been kind of rendered obsolete. 9-11 does put pressure on the paradigm that the, was animating the framers' basic design, and it illustrates for us, as a lot of other things do, like global warming and the like, that we can no longer run away from the fact that we are one small world. Uh, we, we're going to have to have much more robust international national organizations and, and kind of collectivization um, to deal with problems like international terrorism than we did uh, any time in the 20th century. Um, so 9-11 to me does change things a little bit in that it makes clear that the strategy that we relied on for so long is no longer uh, really feasible. Well, what about the role of courts? This is the third point I guess I want to make. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, in, in a trio of decisions three years ago and then in the Hamdan case this past summer involving Osama bin Laden's chauffeur, that the Supreme Court really did s send strong messages to the Bush administration uh, that it was kind of taking two extreme positions. Um, it, was, it was going alone too much. It was, it was kind of not bringing Congress and the American people along. It was violating basic safeguards of, uh, of fairness, like allowing uh, a, a, an accused to be uh, privy to the evidence against him, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think you know, a lot of people will look at the performance of the American judiciary over the past five years and say, ah, they learned their lesson. Um, you know, in, in, in the Civil War, they let Lincoln get away with a lot of things, uh, you know, uh, rescinding the, the, the repealing the, the, the writ of habeas corpus. They allowed uh, FDR to intern Japanese in the Korematsu case. So the Civil War, World War II, the, the American judiciary didn't really stand up and they didn't rein in uh, a, a, a rogue, rogue executive. But now they've learned their lesson a little bit uh, based on the 20th century and they're going to they're be there for us. They're going to um, uh, protect our liberties. I think there's something to that. I, if you, you have never read it, you should probably uh, take a look at a book written by former Chief Justice Rehnquist um, in which he kind of recounted this history of, of judicial acquiescence to executive overreaching um, uh, in any, any kind of wartime. Uh, and I think that mindset um, uh, after Korematsu kind of informed judges' attitude, we're not going to do that again. Uh, but even as courts kind of are standing up and, and, and being counted, uh, let me mention two things about how this, this situation is really different than the Civil War and World War II. First, Lincoln did a lot of extreme things, but he then got congressional approval for almost all of them. You know? He did not literally blow Congress off and pursue executive unilateralism the way President Bush has. So too with FDR. Both of them in wartime did a lot of unprecedented things and then they kind of presented them to the Congress and the American people and said, this is what we thought we needed to do. We need you to back us up here. And Congress did. President Bush could have gotten Congress to approve anything he wanted in the months after 9-11, but he didn't. He, he, he got the, you know, the authorization of use of military force, and then he did the rest behind closed doors with his own bad advisors and never really kind of got buy-in from uh, um, the, uh, the people or the legislative branch, and that's what I think the court is reacting to. Second, um, you know, as, as terrible as 9-11 was and as terrible as, as international terrorism is, it's not the same kind of war that we faced in World War II or the Civil War or the Revolution. Those were three wars we literally had to win or nothing else mattered. You don't win the Revolution, all your theory about liberty and, 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 and kind of equality, none of it matters. So it's same is true of the Civil War. Unless you win that war, you don't have a United States. And World War II was a war for survival. We lose World War II, you know, Cal, what goes on at Cal and, and, and other great academic institutions doesn't matter. It, those were wars for literal survival. The war on terrorism, if it be a war, is, is different. You know? We can sustain losses and still go on as a nation. It's not the kind of all or nothing fight that we faced in the past, which is why the courts, I think, are understandably and correctly much more reluctant to give the president a complete blank check. Final point, and then I'll, uh, and then I'll stop. Um, has to do with the methodology that we use to interpret the Constitution. You're probably aware that conservatives, um, especially neoconservatives, tend to embrace what we call today an originalist approach to the Constitution. We, we should interpret the Constitution by reference to what the framers themselves thought um, and said uh, and the ratifiers believed. Um, 
interest, and, and you know, Justice Scalia and Justice uh, Thomas are kind of big proponents of this on the Supreme Court, and, and President Bush says, I want to appoint judges and justices in their molds. Interesting thing is the claims of kind of very, very broad executive power that have been advanced by the Bush administration tend not to be grounded so much in terms of original intent as they do in terms of modern practical necessity. Um, so the, the Bush administration it basically says, look, y you need a robust, secretive, fast-acting executive to fend off this new threat that no one could have contemplated even 50 years ago. That may or may not be true. The courts are skeptical of it thus far, I think rightly. But it's interesting that there's kind of a methodological inversion, that the conservatives are talking now about the need for flexibility and adaptation to respond to a changing world, um, and not the need to kind of hew closely to uh, what was said in the Federalist Papers and the ratification debates and the like. Um, and that's kind of an interesting point about uh, how we give meaning to this, uh, to this document. <laughs> I, one thing I can say about 9-11 is it didn't need much exaggeration that day <laughs> five years ago. Um, but many of the things that have happened since then, I think, are very difficult to place in a constitutional framework. And that's one of the difficulties I've had over the last five years. And I'm in the middle right now of doing something related to, uh, that should be done by the early October for the New York Times and for PBS on what we're calling the enemy within, which is really a look at the, uh, uh, the internal uh, war on terror or hunt for a second cell, uh, which we were dramatically trying to do right after 9-11. If you remember, there was great fear that there would be a second wave attack. Um, many of the people in the federal government at that time, uh, who I was familiar with because I had covered the area of terrorism before, were really saying they didn't know what was going to happen. And you could, you could imagine that in that kind of national emergency, almost anything was authorized. And as the president has subsequently said, he authorized it. Um, the most uh, significant being uh, when General Hayden, then running the NSA, came to him and said that he needed the authority to wiretap or eavesdrop on electronic communications of people in the United States who might be connected to terrorists or suspected terrorists overseas. And that broke down not only a long-standing wall in terms of the authority of the National Security Agency to wiretap inside the United States, but it, as it has uh, today raised questions about whether the government of the United States has been operating outside the law since shortly after 9-11, because it didn't take into consideration laws that were on the books, like the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. I find it <clears throat> quite amazing uh, that currently there is a law pending, uh, there is a legislation pending in Congress to ex post facto legalize what the President has been doing and what they're doing today. I don't know if that has any precedent in American history, um, where the government of the United States uh, was discovered, and by the way, wasn't discovered because it went to Congress and asked, but was discovered by journalists at the New York Times. After much hesitation, we did publish took 14 months from the time we had the story ready for it to get in the newspaper because of lobbying both by Democrats and Republicans in, in Congress of the, the editors of the New York Times. And so it isn't because this administration came forward and told the American public or told the courts or told Congress about what was going on in full. It's because it was published in the newspaper. And in that sense, the Constitution, I suppose, is very much alive today because we do have freedom of the press, or so we think. I must say that just before I came here and doing my reporting, I was talking to a supervisor in the FBI and to mention to him what I was going to do. And he said, well, just tell him the First Amendment has gone down the toilet. Now, that's coming from a, an FBI supervisor who I'm discussing how we're going to be able to talk about what's going on, given his own fear about his job and potentially being prosecuted for talking with me. Uh, you also note that the uh, Attorney General of the United States has talked openly along with members of Congress about prosecuting members of the press under the Espionage Act, a very vague law that has rarely been used in the past, but which they're now talking about in order to control national security and, nat and secrets. So I think that we're, uh, I don't want to, uh, usually my students get 
get a little depressed listening to me because I go, usually go down this whole long litany of, of all the things that have gone wrong from, or that are in danger, especially if you're a journalist in, in, a, in a country with a constitution. There's Judy Miller who went to jail for 85 days. There's Josh Wolf, who is a local resident in San Francisco who just got out of jail for 30 days and it looks like he's going to go back in related to the government. For instance, in his case, it is directly related to the terrorism war. It's a First Amendment case, but he happened to be videotaping a demonstration in San Francisco of people, I guess, who are self-described anar anarchists. And so the Joint Terrorism Task Force and the federal prosecutor in San Francisco wants his videotape of everybody that he filmed that day, and he's resisting as a journalist and a blogger. And for that, it looks like he's going to spend quite a bit of time in jail. But those are the re th that's the reality from the press side. I also think in covering what's going on, what, and to go back to the eavesdropping and governmental power side of this, uh, and being very familiar personally from reporting with many of the officials in the federal government who were involved in the counterterrorism effort prior to 9-11, that what has happened subsequent to 9-11 continues to happen on an emergency basis. And, and I think we're coming close to a watershed moment, both in the courts and also politically and in the press, about whether or not we're going to take a step back to look at what is the real threat here domestically, in addition to whatever the foreign policy concerns are, how should the laws be written in order to deal with whatever is new about this threat. And I, I remind everybody that we did live through the Cold War. There was a, a large country called the Soviet Union that had tens of thousands of nuclear weapons and every, every kind of weapon of mass destruction you could think of. And yet, we didn't do many of the things that we are currently doing uh, without sanction of Congress and, or the courts. And, that, uh, and we survived all of that by following those rules and trying to stay within those parameters. But I think we're at a watershed moment right now, not just because there's an election in November, because certain realities about what has happened since then, uh, I think are going to come into focus. And one of them is, and uh, there's a professor, John Muller of Ohio State, who's written pretty eloquently about this. If you care, there's an essay in, uh, by him in the most recent uh, foreign policy uh, magazine. Mm -hmm. And it really is the question of have we turned, because of the tragedy of 9-11 and its scale, have we turned the terrorists into the omniscient, omnipresent enemy who can do almost no nothing nothing will stop them from getting to us in some way and creating more mass murder. I would suggest that, the, that what that has done is increased the prestige and power of the very people who we are, we are trying to, if you will, eliminate or stop from hurting us. And, and the President's recent remarks related to Osama bin Laden, for his, who he has been unable to capture in five years, either dead or alive, um, makes him more powerful and puts in danger, I think, a lot of the constitutional protections that we enjoy. Let me just say that in addressing the fundamental questions of counterterrorism, we really face a dilemma that is not yet resolved in the statutes or in the court decisions. And that is, in fighting terrorism, do we use procedures designed to facilitate the gathering and processing of criminal evidence using a law enforcement model? Or do we use procedures uh, designed to facilitate the gathering and processing of foreign intelligence information uh, that allows us to detect, deter, and prevent terrorist acts before they occur. The distinction, I think, is important because uh, it bears remembering that the law enforcement model is one which, except for the prosecution of uh, the crime of conspiracy and related offenses, waits for the act to occur. Uh, the deaths to be suffered and counted, and then use the detective skills we have to seek out the offenders and prosecute and punish them. Um, information, however, gathered and processed from, for example, al-Qaeda, uh, might uh, serve the foreign intelligence role uh, for counterterrorism and counterintelligence, and or serve as evidence of a crime that has occurred uh, or is about to occur. We have struggled with this, I think, as a nation since 9-11 uh, because we're never quite sure whether a terrorist act is a crime and should be treated as a criminal offense and a law enforcement matter in which the police round up the evidence, uh, or as this unique um, 
uh, a matter of national security that requires us to take actions to prevent it from happening in the first place. And the administration took the position uh, after 9-11 that the principal role of the Department of Justice should be to uh, uh, detect and deter and prevent uh, future terrorist acts. And that, that calls for a different model than the traditional prosecutorial role that the Justice Department had been uh, pledged to uh, in the past. It also puts us in uh, some additional quandaries uh, that uh, are difficult to resolve uh, by statute uh, or by court decisions. Uh, and so while I will not stand here or sit here and, and justify what the Attorney General says or what the President has done, uh, I will argue for uh, a healthy understanding of the structural role of the President in, under the Constitution and the inherent powers that the President has. Um, for example, the struggles in the interrogation of detainees, um, uh, including uh, the unlawful enemy combatants, and I would even suggest lawful enemy combatants, uh, not otherwise, uh, the unlawful ones are not otherwise protected by the Geneva Conventions. Um, and to obtain evidence in these cases uh, reflects this, this quandary. And that's the, for, the, the role of the President and the administration in using or not using the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or FISA, uh, reflects that, that particular quandary. Therefore, I want to discuss a few things, and I may run out of time, and, and the moderator can cut me off. But uh, I want to discuss a little bit of this interrogation in the military tribunals uh, uh, for uh, uh, g going after the unlawful uh, enemy combatants. Uh, in light of the new DOD uh, Directive 2310, uh, from which the Army Field Manual uh, has its authority and has uh, been revised as of Wednesday uh, with respect to interrogations, uh, and legislation that was discussed uh, and has been proposed to uh, uh, provide a statutory basis for military commissions, and then the Hamdan decision. And if there's any time left, I'd like to discuss programs uh, to obtain foreign intelligence information, uh, even if it involves communications uh, into or out of uh, the United States. Uh, my, the Hamdan, as you may know, uh, it was a interesting case that uh, invalidated the President's uh, Commission Order Number 1 that provided for a, a setup of military commissions to try uh, the uh, unlawful uh, enemy combatants, those combatants uh, uh, such as terrorists who are not otherwise covered by the Geneva Conventions. Uh, and, um, and the court uh, majority uh, Justice Kennedy uh, moving uh, over to the uh, more moderate or liberal bloc uh, to give them that majority, at least covered in part. This is a 188-page decision. It's uh, pretty thick and pretty uh, laborious to get your way through. But nonetheless, concluded that um, right now there's no statute that currently gives uh, the president authority to establish a military commission or a military tribunal to try these unlawful enemy combatants. Uh, at least the court determined that the authorization of the use of military force that the Congress gave, which is very general, the President may use whatever force is necessary uh, to uh, affect um, uh, the fight on terror, or the uh, Detainee Treatment Act, uh, which included some of the restrictions on uh, the treatment of detainees uh, that Senator McCain pushed uh, in the Senate, but also uh, provided certain restrictions on the judiciary uh, to deal with uh, claims made by those detainees. Uh, but the court said neither of those congressional acts provided a statutory basis, as a basis in co a, a positive law for um, a military tribunal. So the court said that uh, Hamdan can be tried by a military commission only if the trial is authorized by the law of war and the Geneva Conventions are part of the law of war, and Common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions uh, prohibits Hamdan's trial unless he's tried before a, quote, regularly constituted court. And then the court decided that the Commission Order Number 1 courts were not a regularly constituted court. 
the dissent and the majority go back and forth uh, on this question of what constitutes a regularly constituted court and whether there's a requirement of uniformity between regular military courts martial and um, uh, and this military tribunal and uh, and the criminal trials that are conducted in the regular federal district courts and so the majority with Justice Kennedy wins uh, on this question of saying it is not a regularly constituted court, that court that was established uh, as a military tribunal by the president, and therefore it was unconstitutional, but points out, and Vic, I think you'll agree that this is part of the, part of the equation, points out that Congress can change that, Congress can fix that, uh, Congress can establish a statutory basis for a military, uh, uh, military, uh, excuse me, for a, uh, yeah, a military commission um, to try the unlawful enemy combatants. And so now there is a proposal uh, in, the, um, in the Congress, which, um, if I pull out my folder here, includes a number of things uh, that were announced by the administration, one, two, three. Um, there will be, under this proposal that's going to the Congress right now, uh, military tribunals that would not resemble civilian trials or courts martial held in the United States, hearsay evidence and evidence obtained under coercion or duress could be admitted, and suspects could be denied access to classified evidence, although uh, it would be disclosed to their military defense lawyers. Um, so that's the proposal that could go to Congress, that it has gone to Congress, and we'll see if in this short period of time the administration can get the Congress to provide him with that authority. If it does not, then under the Hamdan decision, it's clear that uh, the only thing that's going to work to try uh, as criminals in the law enforcement uh, 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 view of it, the model, uh, these unlawful, uh, uh, unlawful enemy combatants is to do it in a fashion that follows the military courts martial and follow the rules of evidence uh, in the military courts martial. Now, in military courts martial and, and in even in civilian uh, cases before a federal district court judge, uh, there are uh, opportunities to take to the judge classified information uh, that may not uh, be uh, admitted. Uh, or may be admitted, uh, uh, depending on how the judge treats it. And of course, um, there have been a number of circuit courts to, to view that question. But at least some of these issues, the and the principal reason, by the way, the principal reason why the administration is very concerned about the introduction of classified information is uh, in the terrorist network, that kind of information just goes straight to, um, straight to uh, the, uh, the enemy camp. Uh, in the case of the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center, uh, the prosecution was required to give to the defense uh, a list of all the unindicted co-conspirators, a uh, list of uh, 200 some odd people. Uh, that was uh, given to Osama bin Laden. Uh, and uh, we know that because that list was found uh, in, uh, uh, in the investigation of the uh, bombings of the embassies in Africa uh, to be in the possession of Al-Qaeda. So the administration, and I think any administration, uh, this is a nonpartisan issue, has to be concerned about the release of classified information in a court proceeding. And again, brings out this quandary that we face, uh, which is, are we in the business of trying to stop the terrorist act, or are we in the business of trying to prosecute these guys as if they're ordinary criminals? And it's somewhere in between, and I think that the Congress and the courts are going to have to try and resolve that and resolve it in such a way that would withstand constitutional scrutiny. It's a very difficult issue, and I think it's fairly nuanced and is not subject to melodramatic um, uh, responses uh, by either political party, by people who are you know, against Bush at all costs, and people who are for Bush at all costs, uh, or, um, uh, or by, uh, um, uh, you know, partisans in the matter. It is a very difficult question, and it goes to our security and our liberties. And so I'll finish up on, on, on that with respect to the detainee treatment. I would mention that um, the Army Field Manual uh, changes as of Wednesday, uh, the 6th of September, uh, reflect um, the consensus of the Pentagon to eliminate uh, all those manners, uh, m uh, all those styles and manners of uh, uh, interrogation that are 
uh, cruel, in, uh, uh, inhumane, and demeaning, uh, and they go into a full list of uh, interrogation procedures which are now disapproved, including uh, a number of interrogation procedures that were disapproved uh, um, uh, by Secretary Rumsfeld to begin with, and those that Secretary Rumsfeld did approve uh, for use with the unlawful uh, enemy combatants at Guantanamo. So the Army has really moved to conform uh, the treatment of unlawful enemy combatants with those that are protected by the Geneva Convention, such as prisoners of war, who are so protected. And so the Ar new Army Field Manual procedures uh, are, um, uh, um, are very, very strict and provide very few methods of interrogation uh, that um, uh, come close to what happened at Abu Ghraib and, uh, and at Guantanamo. Um, now, the legislation before the Congress uh, would um, uh, codify that, but it would leave the CIA free to do the, uh, that which the military could not do. So again, Congress has to get that one resolved as well. It's entirely possible that we are at the beginning rather than the end of the discussion about what the constitutional rules should be, that the changes in the Constitution, there are always changes. Uh, are just starting. And in that case, we have a discussion going on, and I'd like to comment a little bit about what I at least see are some of the defects in the way we discuss the, 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 these issues and whether there's a better way. And I take some hope in the fact that um, this is indeed not a new subject. It's not at all new. Uh, and that's good, because uh, if it were totally new, it's very hard to talk about policy, it's very hard to talk about law, and the old aphorism, hard cases make bad law. And I think we should be a little optimistic and think that we actually know quite a bit about terrorism, and in particular, we know quite a bit about how you deal with it in the long run. Um, and as I say, there's great experience in this. Terrorism as a theory was invented by academics, thank you so much, in the 1840s. Uh, tried out in the 1870s and has been coming back at regular intervals ever since. Governments usually pass legislation, tyrannical governments pass more draconian legislation. Uh, but, uh, you know, we have experience in seeing what happens. Usually the legislation is effective, although over a distressingly long period of time. So we kind of know what the menu of choices that will come around again in this war on terror are from the earlier ones. Uh, I will point out parenthetically, Al-Qaeda is about the size, about the number of people, about the, the, the budget. Uh, about the capability, frankly, of many earlier terrorist groups. Uh, there was a plot to fly jumbo jets into Haifa in the 1970s. Um, the IRA was clearly more capable in England than Al-Qaeda is today. Um, there are more murderous, and that's a definite change in the subject. But it doesn't mean that there's a complete break with what happened before, and in particular, operationally, I think we have a good sense of what we, uh, what we would want to do, what we need to do, what the options are that, that you would then argue, is this constitutional? And just as a, as a, a marker, I'm not going to go through the whole history, but just as a marker on how old this is, if you go back and you read The Invisible Man, not Ellison, but Wells, you will find that it is a satire on terrorism. Terrorism was a big deal on the continent of Europe in the 1890s, and Wells, with his supremely logical mind, abstracts the terrorism argument, which you can hear on CNN anytime you open the television, and it works like this. Terrorism is easy, it's easy to kill people, and I'm invisible, you don't know how to find me, and then the invisible man starts cackling and saying that uh, he's going to be King Invisible Man the first because anybody who disagrees with him will be killed. This should sound familiar. And Wells, of course, is, is, is with his supremely logical mind telling us a joke, that this sounds really good, it's obviously wrong, and therein lies the joke, right? Um, I think if you look at the history, it is wrong, and it's wrong for two reasons. Um, first of all, terrorism isn't particularly easy. Sending somebody off into a hostile environment where the cops look at him every five minutes and he tries very hard not to twitch is hard for most human beings. Um, the proof of this, I mean, you could have endless examples. Almost all of these plots, many plots, end up 
coming unglued because a policeman looks at some guy crosswise. That's what happened in the Millennium bombing plot most recently. But I think the existence proof for this is that the Israelis got into the business of assassinating PLO people in the 1970s, and they did things that no terrorist group could possibly do. They had the entire Israeli army to pick from. Um, they picked only the best guys. They ran them through little exercises like go infiltrate this Israeli nuclear power plant, then they'd call up the nuclear power plant and cheerfully tell them there's some terrorists on the way, you should catch them. Uh, they sent them to Egypt to practice being spies, did everything you could imagine. And they sent this team to Europe, and the team managed to kill 12 of its targets before finding the wrong guy and killing the wrong guy the 13th time, and worse sin, getting caught. So this is obviously a difficult business. It's not that the terrorists are 10 feet tall, and if you look at any of the history, these plots come unglued with great regularity. So it's not totally easy. And the other thing that I think we know from history quite well is, you know, the terrorist group may be 50 guys, it might be a few hundred guys, they might be invisible, but they are surrounded with people who kind of know what's going on, and those people are sympathizers, and there's an outer circle of people around them who know who these guys are, and in many cases, the, the fight to get rid of terrorism is the fight, I won't say for the hearts and minds, because it's often about terrorizing this middle group, right, but between the state and the terrorists, figuring out who these guys are going to be loyal to, and the state wants these people on the outer ring to spill what they know and break up the terrorist sect, and if you look at Bader Meinhof or all these gangs of the 1970s, it's very much about that, turning the people who are not terrorists themselves, but who know something and can be useful. Terrorists are not truly invisible. So what have governments done historically to attack terrorism, given that this is the structure of the problem? Notice, like all social scientists, I've slipped you a model. Um, Let's, let's just take that seriously for a moment, though. This is, by the way, very standard. You see this talk about the inner and outer circle going back again to the 1870s. Well, the British government has video cameras on lampposts everywhere. According to Denny Hastert, I have no reason to believe this is not true. Uh, we loaned them our electronic surveillance assets for the recent London bomb plot. They did these sneak and peek warrants. All of this is stuff you've seen in the last couple of weeks. And they did these really massive searches. Let's go find 400 computers and 70 houses and turn them upside down. Um, that's the recent experience. We also know a lot about the 9-11 report. I'm going to borrow this as if I had the foresight. Um, it's a book that really bears reading, right? Everybody talks about it and nobody reads. Um, four of the 19 terrorists were flagged by something called CAPS, which was a uh, profiling, I know that's a dirty word, but a profiling program uh, for baggage. And if, those, if the CAP system had been connected to people going on the airplanes, then that obviously would have been interesting, right? Profiling is a very ambiguous business. All these measures are dirty, ugly measures, but I'm just trying to say the kinds of things that we know work. Um, and finally, you know, there's all this talk about every time there's a rumor of a plot, the U.S. goes out and disrupts it. We know what that looks like. The Millennium Bomb Plot, uh, the, the policewoman walks up to the terrorist or the, the suspicious person, and she gets in his space and starts asking hard questions and makes him nervous, and that gives her grounds to go do more of this. This is called rousting, right? I mean, we can look at this. This is not what we would wish on the society. If we dial up that dial, it's not a good thing for us. But these are effective tactics. These are the kinds of choices we're looking at. Um, and also, uh, you know, in the 1980s, um, the Italians set up basically the equivalent of our witness protection program, but informers work in penetrating that outer ring of people. Um, we, uh, in the latest British bomb plot, have arrested spouses, or the British have, for harboring their spouses. That offends many people. We did it in the 30s with gangsters. Um, and of course, there's, uh, you know, lots and lots of surveillance issues. These are things that democracies have done. It's interesting that a totalitarian government has basically never had a terrorism problem, precisely because in a contest on who can terrorize this outer ring of people, the totalitarian government wins hands down every time. They can do things like collective punishment, we'll just shoot the village, that's what Hitler did. Um, they can move populations to some other location at the first sign of trouble, Stalin did that. They can most importantly censor the newspapers. If terrorism is mostly about publicity, 
doesn't matter. You can do anything you want. It doesn't show up in the papers. And of course, the biggest thing is that everybody in one of these societies is terrified, uh, and they'd much, they're more afraid of going to the gulag than they are of, of being assassinated by their erstwhile friends, the terrorists. We don't want to go to those places, but the first kinds of, of uh, menu of things that the British and we and the Italians in the 70s have done are all plausibly constitutional. They may not be constitutional, but they're the kind of thing that we would plausibly be talking about as we have this discussion discussion about what should the proper balance be, okay? And there's this word balancing, and when a lawyer ends up balancing something, you can go to almost any Supreme Court case, I pick five at random, um, it turns out when you read the opinion, the balance is never close. Uh, on the one hand, we have security, and on the other hand, we have uh, personal liberty, and let's say I come out for security, ah, you know, the personal liberty interest is very small, don't worry about it, and we get this enormous benefit from, um, from security by this measure, therefore it's constitutional. Or you can invert that, but this is how you, you know, you tend to structure the argument if you're a lawyer. Uh, we don't take the balancing seriously. I think what we all know in our hearts, but we wish it were the other way, is that all those balancing questions tend to be much harder than that. You're probably giving up something real. These are hard choices. If they weren't hard choices, we would have decided them already. So how do you go about this balancing business? Well. My sense of the way the discussion works right now is as follows, and then I will try and give you a recommendation, but uh, it's a hard business to have recommendations. Um, right now, if I'm a security advocate, I have this wonderful tool. I'm a lawyer by training, so I know how to make these arguments to the court. A lot of people here could buy and sell me as a lawyer, but still, I have the training in the bar cart. Um, and the security guys, the, the pro-national security guys say, look, there's going to be, you know, imagine that, that you vote against our proposal, and the next day there's this horrible tragedy. You know, how are you feel and how are we going to humiliate you in the political discussion that ensues when we're all looking for whose fault this was? Now that's not a very sensible way to think about this sort of problem because we none of us live as Monday morning quarterbacks. We make decisions up front and, and we trade probabilities. And what's really going on if I vote down something as too intrusive on civil liberties is I'm accepting a slightly larger chance that something bad will happen. Right? This is the common sense of the problem. And as mature people, we do that. We accept slightly larger risk. But of course, in our world, when the risk actually falls due, it is massive and painful. And that's the conundrum here. And there is all kinds of social science which is very instructive. There's a beautiful risk psychology literature that says human beings hate the statement, if you do this thing, there will be a 0.02% greater chance that something bad will happen. Human beings hate that. There's enormous dissonance. And so what happens is you want to make it not a 0.02% chance, but a unity, 100% chance, because it gets rid of your dissonance. And that tends to drive you in favor of saying, OK, to the security thing. I, can't, I hate the idea of let's take a little risk, and we can live freer. Um, let's adopt the security thing, and this little stone in my shoe, this 0.02% incremental risk, will go away. And that's very robust by people who discover risk or who study risk perception. So what does the guy on the other side do, right? So you've got the guy who wants to argue for civil liberties. Well, he has a couple of choices. One is he can say, this is an extreme position, but I've heard it in the last couple of weeks, even on the talking heads on CNN. Look, um, it's not going to happen. Right? Just don't worry about it. There won't be another 9-11. There wasn't one before. There hasn't been one since. Uh, we can go down the street and, and things will be fine. And that's a way to get rid of dissonance, right? That's, you know, we'll rationalize it. We'll try real hard to believe there won't be another one. Look, there is a statistical chance of another 9-11 today. No matter how hard you and I wish it to be one thing or the other, that's, that's the truth of the matter, right? That's the grown-up, let's look at the facts, we're running a risk. But we hate that, so one strategy, not a very good strategy for the civil liberties guy, is to say, well, yes, you're right, the chance is zero, go back to sleep, reduce your dissonance, um, this is not a big deal. The more common way that people try and argue the other side, and you know, 9-11 is a great jury argument, right? So the civil liberty side has a big problem on their hands. The more classical way you see people argue about 9-11 is, okay, look, this security measure isn't going to do anything. It's going to make the most of us miserable, but a real terrorist will get around it. And the point of the examples that I gave you before is, I don't think that's true. Things that seem rather small, like this goofy airline profiling system, which everybody laughs at, everybody can beat it, actually had some teeth on the problem. And in fact, if you go read random history of terrorism, you will find that 
terrorists trip up over relatively small things all the time. So it's not nothing, right? But one way that you can argue this is to say, well, look, terrorism is a certainty, and nothing we can do will change it effectively. That's terribly defeatist. And what's really interesting is, you know, if you look at crowd psychology, the British lived under people dropping 500, pound, 500 tons of bombs on them every night. We're actually very tough as a people, and, and it's kind of good to remind us that, look, we can hack it. So can I improve this? Well, the thing I'm not going to try and do to improve this discussion is to do the balancing for you and say you should adopt this measure and not that, and this one is constitutional and that one isn't, because that involves a lot of values about what a reasonable balance is, and I believe academics have no particular advantage in telling you values. We're very good at facts. We're very good at methods. Values is something that we find very hard to teach. We may not have much superior advantage that way. But I think I can talk about process. And public policy is largely about recommending process. And what I would like to urge on you is that how we could improve this discussion so we have honest discussions where everybody admits there's a chance of terrorism now, and this new method is going to decrease the chance of terrorism but infringe our civil liberties, and is that a trade that we want to do? This is a discussion we're going to be having in the Supreme Court, I believe, forever, but at least for the next few years. Uh, can we improve that? And I think the one thing that we could do today, people in academia, uh, people in the Democratic Party, um, would be the following. Right now, the Bush White House has a whole slate of terrorism measures which they say are the right balance. And we criticize those. But as I've tried to suggest to you, the criticism is a little formless. And, the, and it devolves into places that aren't as rational as the discussion could be. There is a second model. I think it would be a wonderful service. It might even be good politics, but I don't pretend to be an expert on that. Um, to come up with a shadow government proposal, the way the British do, and to say, look, you don't need to be overboard about terrorism. Here's a reasonable set of things that will address the problem. Are these things as draconian as the Bush administration? No. Um, are they as likely to catch al-Qaeda? Maybe slightly less, but the price is worth it. Um, surfacing this as a frank discussion with specifics would be tremendously instructive. And I can say as sort of the, 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 you know, to the extent that you have this broad middle line of, of voters who are sort of tired of the punchy, punch and Judy show between the left and the right, um, I think I count myself there. I would love to have the debate that follows when we have two tickets of what I would do if elected to combat terrorism and why that's the appropriate uh, balance for your liberties. Thank you. Let me go back to the basic Article 1, Section 8. It did not give the President the power to declare war. It reposed that power solely in the Congress of the United States. Now, that's not to say that the President didn't have the right to react I uh, have since the time of the Barbary pirates, uh, since the 1800s against Britain and France on the high seas. Presidents have reacted with warlike acts. But if you're going to make war, and it's going to be a formal war, and Congress is given the power to declare it and not the president, Congress has twice in my lifetime acted at its peril and instead of declaring war, has given a president the right to make war. You'll recall the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution in 1964. I was on active duty in the Marine Corps at the time. The president, the Secretary of Defense and State went to the Congress and said, we have been attacked a second time by the destroyers of North Vietnam. Give me the power to make war. And the resolution said the president shall have the right to meet aggression with aggression in Southeast Asia. That was passed in the summer of 1964. Congress didn't declare war, but there is a political reality that accompanies our nation when it's in war, and that is that the Congress becomes like a herd of sheep. They will follow bang and mang, they will follow a Congress for fear that if they take on a president commanding a war, that they will be deemed inhibiting the making of war, or worse, disloyal to the troops that are fighting that war. And so it's a matter of reality. I was in the Congress uh, shortly thereafter. Men who had voted and women who had voted to authorize President Johnson to make war were very reluctant to admit that they had made a mistake. 
very reluctant to come out and vote against a war. It wasn't until 1971, seven years later, that the Congress voted to repeal the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. And shortly thereafter, the President invaded a wholly new country, if you'll recall, Cambodia, in 1971, which caused an eruption on many campuses, including this one. And I was here, uh, I was once tear gassed on this campus as a member of Congress, siding with students who were opposing this war. Not far from here, a place called Spal Praza. Maybe some of you were there. <laughs> well, in any event, Congress not only is reluctant to vote against a president's power, but they're reluctant to hold oversight hearings. And one of the effects of 9-11 is that there have been no real oversight hearings by the Congress, either the House or the Senate, over the conduct of this war until fairly recently, four years. And the Congress is certainly intended to be a check and balance on the President of the United States. I, uh, how many of you, in basic political science, how many of you are familiar with the case of Marbury versus Madison? Show of hands, nearly everybody, right? Marbury versus Madison established the power of the Supreme Court, not known necessarily at the beginning of our country or the founding of the Constitution. It gave the Supreme Court the right to hold an act of Congress unconstitutional. It created something called judicial supremacy. What is not readily understood is a case that followed it a year later in 1804 called the case of the flying fish. Congress had voted to give the president the power to seize ships carrying contraband into French ports. We were in a sort of a naval war with the British and French. They were capturing our crews and carrying contraband to France was made illegal. Well, President Adams, a, uh, what would pass for a Republican president today, uh, gave an order to seize a ship coming out of a French port. And the ship captain and the uh, owners sued to get their ship back. And they said Congress acted to give the president the power to seize ships going into French ports, but he didn't give them the power to seize them coming out. And the Supreme Court agreed. Chief Justice Marshall ruled that when Congress had acted and given the president one power, that they didn't give him the corollary power and must have intended, and they gave the ship back to the owners. And that was the second horn of judicial supremacy. It gave the Supreme Court the power to declare an act of the Congress, of the President of the United States, the executive branch, unconstitutional. Well, what's happened since 9-11, the impact on the Constitution, is you have seen no challenge by the Congress to any actions of the President. Uh, the two most significant, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act in 1978, we passed a law and we said, look, if there's a danger of terrorism or a subversion or espionage, the president can tap phones if he goes to the court and gets a warrant. And if in a case of emergency, he can go to get the warrant three days later. And the President of the United States says, nuts to you. I'm not going to be bound by that restriction of Congress on foreign intelligence surveillance. I'm given the power to make war, and this is a president that loves the war power. You can't hear a speech where he isn't going to talk about the war on terror as being the basis. And there's a reason for that politically, because if he's conducting a war on terror, he can suppress the dissent of those who oppose what he is doing, whether it's torturing prisoners or invading the privacy by electronic surveillance, and he's done both. And I'm afraid that the only thing that is going to change this particular impact on the Constitution is that fifth branch of government. I, uh, I would say that perhaps the fourth branch of government, you've heard from one of its distinguished representatives today, is the press. But note that this administration has been able to in many ways silence the press by suggesting that whatever the press reveals that hurts the war on terror, such as the electronic surveillance system, in itself is treason and thus threatens the press with suppression, which leaves the decision to the fifth branch of our government of the United States under the Constitution, which is the people that every two years can elect a new Congress of the United States if it chooses. And there's the worst problem of all, and I find it particularly on this great campus, which once led the effort against wars, uh, whether presidents were operating legally or illegally. Young people don't seem to care enough to vote. The voting percentage in the recent elections was 28 percent. Now, if, 20, if only 28 percent of the people participate, then the Constitution, which at least intended a substantially higher percentage, could 
Will there be a counterforce to force the Congress to exercise its traditional check and balance system uh, and check the President in the excessive abuses of governmental power? And I, I go back to the basic Constitution on this because I think it was Abraham Lincoln once said that the reason that Congress was given the power to declare war and not the President was that kings, when they were in danger of rebellion at home or were in difficulty with their people, the way to unite the people was to get them into a war. So we weren't about to give the president the power to declare war, but in, in the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, we gave him the power to meet aggression. The language of what Congress did is a fearful abdication of its power. The, it said, if I can read this correctly, uh, the president will have the power, this was October 2002, to use the armed forces of the United States as he determines to be necessary and appropriate in order to defend the national security of the United States against the continuing threat posed by Iraq. Now, if there ever were a constitutional abdication of authority, this wasn't a matter that the president needed an immediate authority to go to Iraq or do something. There were months before he had to go to Iraq. But was there any congressional debate on it? Was there any discussion of whether he should go to a war in Iraq or what the conditions would be? And there is that political reality again that the Congress, in the face of a foreign threat, will back like a herd of sheep and will allow the president to exceed the powers, in fact, not even try to control his exercise of those powers. And to me, that's the tragedy of 9-11, that 9-11 and the President's ability to convince us that we were at war, uh, and we are at war with al-Qaeda and the militant Islamists, uh, no question about it, but to magnify that war, to give him the powers and to back off the, the powers of the Congress or the willingness of the Congress to exercise checks and balances, I think has been a, a true tragedy. I know. I was in the Congress with Dick Cheney. I know how he thinks about this. He was the Chief of Staff for President Ford uh, from 1974 to 76, and he felt that the executive branch had been deprived of powers because the Congress in the early 70s, you'll recall, passed the War Powers Act. We investigated the CIA, uh, found the terrible things that had been going on there, and did emasculate the executive branch of government of some of the powers that a president would like to have to exercise in the face of a threat like terrorism, a very real threat. But the fact that the Congress has been absent from the deliberations, wholly absent from its holding congressional hearings to, to investigate uh, abuses or incompetences, uh, of which there have been many, uh, I think has been the tragedy of 9-11 and the impact on the Constitution. And I hope the voters would restore that this November by electing a Congress which will insist on check and balance hearings, congressional hearings, to look into everything this administration is doing. And perhaps the worst threat of all, I think, is the threat to the press. Uh, we were saved at one time by the New York Times and the Supreme Court. The New York Times had printed the Pentagon Papers. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, held that uh, they should be allowed to be presented, and we learned some truth about Vietnam that changed public opinion against the war. I don't think that would happen today, Lowell. I think that today, if the President said that some uh, release of information would hurt the war on terror, I'm afraid the Supreme Court would allow the President to suppress that information. And so the real price we pay is a secret government operating in secret ways without either a press or a Congress standing up to demand the truth from the government. And government will always lie. I can give you a personal uh, experience. Uh, uh, my debate partner, Stanford Law School, I haven't done what much with my own life. My debate partner was John Ehrlichman, and I was a year uh, ahead of uh, Sandy Day O'Connor and Bill Rehnquist in the law school. Nice people. But John Ehrlichman went from being a fine, honorable lawyer to going to jail for lying to the Congress. And I had made the first speech to impeach Nixon. It had sort of interfered with our friendship. Our kids had grown up together. So I went to see John in the federal penitentiary in Safford, Arizona. I said, John, we ought to be friends again. Tell me, what caused you, an honorable lawyer, to lie to the Congress, lie to a grand jury, to protect the President of the United States from the truth about Watergate? And John took about 30 seconds looking out across the desert. There's no fence around the Safford prison. There's Fort Huachuca and some Indian reservations in the distance, but nobody really walks away from it. And after 30 seconds, John said, Pete, 
It took us three and a half years to be corrupted by the power of the White House. And the balance of the Constitution, I think, is to check and balance the power that inevitably, or the corruption that inevitably accompanies power. It's the only rule of poli sci I can say that is irrevocable, and that is that power corrupts. Thank you. Thank you.